Uh, I just want to say thank you so much to all the presenters. You guys took time, energy from your day to present to impact the community. I love to hear from the audience if there's a specific question on a specific presentation that you heard today or in general, what are the questions that you guys have top of mind? What has stirred your mind going and uh, really ask those questions? And don't wait for Steve Levy to 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 put one in. Someone someone beat him to the punch. I can start. Uh, for for the for the the presenters, why did you choose to be involved with this? Steve, you're on mute. I, I can go first. Oh, go for it, yeah. Steve. No, Chris, go. Uh, well, Dan, you and I have connected about this. Um, I got my starts in the sourcing world in particular from people who are very generous with their time and their knowledge. Um, I was a, a very um, blessed benefactor of that. And I, I feel obligated and, and hopeful that I can do the same for others. Uh, and so a platform like For Recruiters by Recruiters, where it's free for anybody to attend, free knowledge for everybody, uh, just made sense for a natural um opportunity to give back to the community. I'll echo that. Uh, my my motivation was um, we don't hear, we, we hear a lot of same faces and same voices in the TA space. And I was really interested in hearing new voices. And even if it's the topic might be the same, but we're hearing it from a different point of view. But again, I'm just finding this wasteland of conversation around the aging worker, worker engagement, multi-generational teams, I know there are subject matter experts out there, and that's part of my challenge is to connect the neural dots to see if I can build a community of like-minded people. And so part of it is to share so people know this is my passion and what my a vocation might be, but also to find resources and people that can assist me in building a stronger community. You know, if you see something, say something. And I'll, I'll chime in now. Um, I agree <laughs> with everything. Uh, you know, that both Chris and Steve had said, and, and, you know, I'm here for selfish reasons too. I'm unemployed. <laughs> Something that I, as I, you know, blacked out during that presentation, <laughs> I didn't say is, you know, if you're hiring or, you know, somebody who's hiring um, and looking for an exceptional, you know, diversity focused full cycle recruiter, that's why I'm here to get in front of recruiters and also the camaraderie and um, to learn. I have taken a ton of notes and, um, I will definitely uh, take what I learned today to my next employer. So thank you, everybody. One of the questions in the chat, it says, how can you show the world the unlimited potential of a recruiter? I don't want to just hog this. So people need to chime in, but um, I'm doing it through blogging and living out loud um, as a recruiter and now as a you know a job seeking recruiter. And I think if more recruiters did so and and we talked about these things um, and we didn't let our reputation hurt our feelings over and over again. <laughs> um, and we really focused on, okay, the reason we have the reputation that we have is because of misinformation. Um, but I know that I also know that it can be exhausting fighting misinformation. So just communicate. Another one, it says, how has your approach to job search changed since becoming more community minded? And how will your professional behavior change once on track? Tiffany, you want to take this one? Yeah, so I don't, um, this is the first time I've had to look for a job, right? I've been in lots of situations where I was working with somebody or for somebody and somebody said to them, I need this done. Oh, Tiffany would be great for that. And it really just has been super um, simple, easy, straightforward. And it's all based on who I've known, right? And I was uh, let go at the end of January and I started my networking piece um, right away. And conversations just take time. You know, I'm talking to somebody in one minute who uh, had to schedule me a month out, right? 
but I'm keeping those going and, um, and staying on top of them. Cause I really do believe that, um, I'm going to find my next job through my network. A B I'm still applying to jobs. And then I go on the back end and find out who the hiring manager is and reach out to them and figure out who the recruiter is and so on. And even after I'm rejected, even if I get rejected right away, I, I follow up with them, wait for them to get back to me. There's one person, um, who I did that with, who just reached out to me and said, they want to schedule an exploratory call. I don't know what it's about. So it may or may not be about a job, but so I guess what I'm saying is like, I feel like I've been community minded and I'm leveraging the community. And that's something that I will always do because I believe in it and I've seen it work. So if I can be that person for you, Rachel, or for any other job seeker, I am available to you. In the same way, um, kind of echoing what Tiffany was saying as well, uh, I went back and asked the person that ended up uh, helping get me hired into my contract job and said, well, what was it that, you know, changed for you? I mean, this is somebody I've known for 15 plus years, somebody that, you know, back when it was uh, the day and age where they took you out to lunch just because they wanted to keep you in their uh their, their group of people that would, you know, listen to them when there was jobs available, when the market was very different. Um, she said, I reached out, you know, I, I was trying to do my networking that I've been doing and, and be more community minded. And she said it was between that and seeing the activity on my LinkedIn page that really showed her that <clears throat> I'm still one of the engaged recruiters. I'm still making those efforts. and. Uh, th that was huge. That meant a lot to me. Another one, it says, do you have a, any suggestions around how to handle the stress and anxiety of the timelines and pressure from the hiring manager while trying to maintain a high level of success in your role? Chris, how about you? That is such a, a good question because it's going to be different for every person. Um, what, in, in my experience, what it comes down to is getting, uh, agreements for timelines and what that's going to look like. Uh, I operate in a sourcer's capacity, not a recruiter's. And so my, my recruiting counterparts that I support, uh, their expectations with hiring managers looks very different. Um, but ha having those, those SLAs of, you know, Hey, from the time I start working on a role to the time that I, uh, launch a drip campaign to the time that I'm interviewing and introducing uh, qualified and interested candidates, um, you know, is, is very concrete, uh, and, and what that looks like. Um, it doesn't necessarily alleviate the pressure and the anxiety, uh, because I, I hit send, uh, you know, on that, that first email of my, my drip campaign. Uh, and all I, all I can do at that point is hope that I did my job well enough that, uh, you know, those that are qualified or, or at least seem to be, uh, are also going to be interested and want to have a conversation. Um, so uh, I, what it boils down to at that point is in my nurturing a relationship with my hiring managers. Uh, there's a handful of teams that I support that uh, I'm invited to be a part of weekly team meetings. Um, and I, I don't make every single one. If I have conflicts, you know, I, I'm unable to attend. That, that happens. Uh, but attending those as frequently as I can and providing meaningful updates and meaningful information uh, has helped to alleviate some of that pressure and that anxiety. Uh, it's also allowed for feedback to come back my direction of, you know, maybe I missed the mark just a little bit. You know, maybe there's something that a trend that we're seeing that we need to address earlier on in the process. Um, but a lot of it really is that relationship investment and and uh, creating those uh, SLAs for uh, leveled expectations. Niha, working at Google, you probably yeah. experience some of this pressure and anxiety and stress and hiring managers want a role filled tomorrow. What in your experience have you had success with managing this? So just like Chris, I have I was also mostly on the sourcing side and you know so my clients were my recruiters primarily. But then yes, pretty much to answer the question, uh keep those relationships as close as possible, you know, keep them informed. Uh, you know, where are you in the process, even if it's for sourcing or recruiting, how long it's going to take, what are the obstacles or challenges you're facing? Um, are there any ways to, you know, tweak around the job description? Are there anything else they're looking at? So have that 
communication constantly going with the hiring managers and with your recruiters. I think it helps one build the trust between you and and the team and also, you know, gives you that much of clarity of how you need to work towards that end result that you're looking at. Anybody else? Of course, <laughs> I have something to say on that. You know, for me, um, I am a full cycle recruiter, um, but it starts with everything that we've talked about. We've talked a lot about candidate experience and how to find candidates, but we haven't, there's been a little bit of conversation around hiring managers, but it's just as important to build uh, these relationships and get to know our hiring teams as much as possible. Um, you know, great idea, you know, showing up to regular team meetings for your engineering department or your marketing department or whoever you're hiring for. But really, um, you know, we're talking about SLAs earlier, Chris mentioned, it's all that your intake, make sure you're doing an intake, even if it's, if it's a, you know, a product role that, you know, you've been filling, you know, every 18 months or you're growing the team always do the intake because that is where you can set all the expectations. And if you say you're going to do something, you need to do it. I, and I also want to just add that um, what Nia said, I believe um, it was Nia that sending updates on a regular basis. I, you know, um, oddly enough, you know, most recently my hiring managers, I shared a shared Google doc. They could see in real time, where all the candidates in play, the stage, I'm a Excel <laughs> that weirdo, but um, they they wouldn't go check it, even though they had real time access to it. So I was annoyed by it. I'm not going to lie, but what I started doing was, well, where do they live? They live in Slack. So at least every other day, I slacked all of my you know current hiring managers their updates. Um, it was sort of CYA. No one's going to say that I, they don't know where I can say they don't know where it's at, but also whether they read it or not, it's just showing them that they can, you know, trust me more and more as a recruiter. You know, that kind of speaks to my frustration is the high volume tracking administrative side. And I'm hopeful that AI will be an increasingly uh, helpful component, sending out notifications on my behalf or being able to help me craft some of that because when you're doing administrative tracking you're not recruiting and again the skill set that we're supposed supposedly bringing value is not scribe and data administration it's consultative skills providing feedback um, contextual information about candidates and managers so my, my big frustration is more admin just takes me away from my passion and my skill set I think sometimes we have so much information in the world right now that we need to utilize it and be true business partners to the business and talk business versus talking recruiting. And what does that mean for the business and what they're losing out on if that person isn't in the role? And leading with data, setting expectations from that first call, and then get action items at the end of every single meeting that you have of saying, I will commit to giving you 25 qualified candidates to review by the next meeting. But in order to do so, we will review those. And if they look good, let's do a drip campaign that you're involved with, because what that will do is there have some investment because they're sending a message to the candidate. And if they reply back, you already set up a phone screen. The intent of the converse or that message is we're gonna, if they reply, we're gonna get them in process. So they can't go back and forth on what they said that they were gonna commit to. So get them in in the process as early on as possible. Set expectations, set goals, and set um follow-ups with your hiring managers because then if they don't come through, you can say, hey, I did my part. I held myself accountable to this. You need to do it on your end. Because if not, does this role, is that really important? And if they say, yeah, it's super important. Okay, well, should I go to your boss and say that we had a structure thing in place, a plan to execute, and you're not executing it? I have other roles that I need to fill that they're bought in and push it back on them. Because then the accountability is there. 
in my experience that has worked extremely well yeah just to chime in don't be afraid to hold the other party responsible and accountable and ask the right set of questions just be curious you know what kind of candidates do you want are you looking at certain schools are you looking at certain uh, companies or do you not want these companies so just be prepared with those questions will also you know kind of help you when you are doing sourcing and recruiting uh, for those roles so yeah a big tip too is when you're reaching out to candidates they want to see they want to feel what type of team that they're going to be joining what kind of leader that they're looking for so whether it's taking them your hiring manager in your linkedin posts you know at amazon i created a separate landing page for that specific team that i was supporting so in my reach out i said hey look at this landing page and it had the leaders it had the people that were and titles that people were on that team, what type of projects they were working for, working on, different videos that they had about the specific product. So it was easy for them to understand what they would get themselves into. So if they responded, they already had some sort of interest and understand what that team is all about. So then you didn't have to educate. It's about getting them on the phone with the hire manager as quickly and as often as possible. That's gonna increase um, and decrease your time to fill. And Dan, in doing that, um, how much of that was your effort alone? Did you go through marketing? Where's who's helping you do this landing page, populating it with content? Are you now a content curator in addition to being a sourcer, recruiter, admin person? Yeah, good, good question. At every company, there's obviously different limitations and resources. Um, so you got to figure out uh, who is involved and what you can. I'm not. I'm all about not reworking the wheel. Um, so if it's already done, figure that out. But if it's a new idea, um, maybe that's a, a stretch project that you can work with your leaders and understanding that the market is switching and they want to be more involved in the process. We're visual people now. So before they apply to anything, I'm sure they looked on their LinkedIn profile, looked at the website, looked at some YouTube videos, looked at their TikTok video. All those different things are touch points. So crafting that message in a landing page is maybe a stretch project that's not in your job description, but you'll be able to maximize the, the potential within that team. They I still argue, I'd use argue it is in your job description. I think yeah, we for are sure. becoming content curators. We are we becoming are. product knowledge experts. We do have to know the team structures. We have to know leadership styles. It's again, we are beyond the, the scribe, note taker, go fill this job order. Uh, we are becoming truly consultants. And that does require a different tool, tool belt to be effective. For sure. For sure. Uh, any other questions from the chat? Jake had another one, and then we we can probably take maybe one or two more. But do you have a list of common questions you you ask the hiring manager for all your roles that you're working on? Dan, I'm happy to jump in on this one. Sure. Um, so I well, I've had the opportunity to work with a couple amazing recruiters uh, here at, at BECU, and uh, one of the things that we constantly try to revolve around is what does success look like. Um, you know, ra rather than asking like, what does your ideal candidate look like? Or, uh, you know, what, what would you like to have? It's, it's what would a, a candidate, a successful candidate look like in their first 30, 60 or 90 days? Um, cause then, then we're really fleshing out the, uh, you know, the must haves and the nice to haves, right? Uh, every hiring manager is going to give you a laundry list of things that they would like their candidate to have. But when you ask them like, Hey, what does success look like in the first 30 days of employment? And they're like, oh, they would need to be able to do these things. So I'm like, great, that's my must haves. Everything else we can ramp up and we can we we can, you know, have a little bit of flex. Obviously, where you 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 might run into uh, compensation and, and HR uh, qualifications, minimum qualifications that you still have to meet. Um, but but that's that's how you can start taking more of that consultative approach. Um, the other question that we, we really like to talk about uh, is, is very data-based. Um, you know, at, at BEC, we have about 30% of all of our hires are organic applications. Um, the rest uh, are, are a majority of either internal movement or uh, employee referrals. 
and, and only the top 10% or I shouldn't say top because it, it, no, no one's worth more than, than anybody else, right? But the, the remaining like 10% comes from sourcing, right? So we'll, we'll present that data and we're like, odds are over 50% chance that someone that is joining this team either is within our organization right now or is within, within our organization's network. Do you know anybody in your network that is qualified and might be potentially interested? Um, is, is, is the other route that we take. Um, between those two questions, we, we can approach things in a way that makes a lot of sense to the hiring manager. They can start to visually see and imagine what that person really looks like in the role as opposed to this figurative uh, laundry list of things that they would like to have. Love it. Uh, there's one come in. It says maybe Steve can take this one. How do you overcome the fear of what um, I'm going to do after 65 and live in the present? I think that's a fair question for everybody on this call. Um, just because I'm in that age group, I can speak to it from a personal standpoint, but everyone's a different person with different backgrounds and we all have our fears and inhibitions. So I don't know if there's a, a real good response to that, but I think it's something that people should be asking themselves at various stages in their life and in their career. Like, what do I really want? Uh, what what is my biggest concern? What hurdles do I have to overcome? What's my plan? Right? And what's that old line from uh, Mike Tyson? Everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. So having a plan isn't isn't the solution, but you've got to start somewhere. So even if it's forecasting five years out, where do I want my life to look like? What what how do I want my days to be spent? I get a lot of stuff on Quora. I read uh, a lot of posts there, and it's amazing how many people you know, the algorithm kind of feeds you some of the same stuff over and over again. How many people in their 60s and 70s have a, like an unrational fear of not knowing what to do with themselves after they retire? And my own anecdotal evidence is people that retire, they love the first month or two, they're off the clock, they don't have any meetings to go to, and then they're bored. They start to realize, I don't really have a plan for post work. And maybe my social network isn't as big as I thought it was. And I don't have as many hobbies and interests as maybe I could have. So I think the question is, I'm not sure what you do after 65 or 60 or 55, but that's a very personal question. And maybe a life coach or a performance coach would be a good value to you. Awesome. As we wrap up, let's go around the room and share one last minute advice um, and what you want to tell the audience as we move forward. Chris, how about you start? Um, there have been a lot of really good information nuggets shared today. I, uh, I'm sure we all took a lot away that we, we really can apply immediately and improve ourselves. The last nugget that I would share is if you want to see your response rates increase as you're reaching out to candidates, you want to see that success, please put your salary range, your compensation range in that initial email. You list that and you're transparent from the get-go. You're going to have a better candidate experience. You're going to see responses, even if it's a no, and they're like, hey, I appreciate you reaching out, but I'm out of budget you're going to create a better experience with that that initially led recruiter transparency uh, and you're going to see those response rates climb. Love it. Rachel, how about you? Love that, Chris. <laughs> um, I think there's a reason I had a 100% close rate in 2023 and it's because I was able to share full ranges for all of our roles all the time. So it's something to think about and advocate for. But I just, my last point, I guess, would just be fear came up, I think, uh, just, just a minute ago. And um, remembering everyone has it, whether whether it's rational and it exists or, you know, whatever it is, um, fear of the unknown is, uh, like Steve said, it has no limits in age or, or anything. Um, I, from my own personal experience, can tell you that uh, while I'm only 46 and I don't know if I'm ever going to retire, um, watching family members go through it, it, Steve is absolutely right. It is different in every person. Um, but the, the biggest thing is just to remember we're all human, whether we're talking about ourselves, you know, our community of recruiters, hiring teams, candidates, just remember we're all human and, um, it starts with, uh, you know, showing yourself some grace and then showing the community around you some grace. And I think when we remember that 
you know, there's so many of us here that are unemployed and looking and stressed and so many of us worried about our future, not necessarily in our 60s, but looking into that future. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and I maybe I should be embarrassed to admit that, but but I'm not. I'm I'm living I'm living my experience. So just don't be so hard on yourself and lean in on your community. Nia, how about you? I think uh, one I want I want to say a big thank you to you Dan and Steve and Hyorizi as a community. When I got impacted last year November, uh, you know LinkedIn became kind of a black hole. I literally was on LinkedIn for every day, majority of the time. But then I shut it down. I was like this. There was too much. Uh, you know, the, people were going on and on and on about all the negativity with the layoffs. I didn't want to read that. And then I came across Nicole Foley's post on Hire Easy. And I'm like, okay, Nicole is there. Let me see what it's all about. And then I I watched all the the previous uh, webinars. I attended both of them. And then I am here today presenting uh, on one. So all I want to say is keep your chin up. This is just a phase. It will pass out. And uh, as I've told Ryan this. I'm a big uh, optimistic. Um, things will work out. Uh, and we're seeing it, the market is improving. So just, just believe in the community. And I'm amazed how strong the TA community is. And everyone is willing to help each other. Uh, if you need any help from me, uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to even hear, um, you know, just listen in. So, yeah. Just, just hang in there. Ryan, how about you? I'd say take a chance. Um, you know, it's so easy to uh, get frozen in fear and not try new things. Uh, but we learn a lot from our failures. So even if you fail, you're learning something, you're growing, you're trying something. Um, my suggestion is just take some chances. Steve, how about you? My closing slide. You're awesome. And we are. Uh, we are very talented people with a wide variety of skills that we've accumulated over time. So how adaptable are we? I think that's the question. Can we be responsive, able to respond to conditions without going down the rabbit hole of self-doubt and fear? So, you know, watch your own language. Be attention to what your self-talk is. Look for the helpers because they're out there. And believe when I say it, we're, this is an awesome group of people with skills that have a lot to contribute. So find where your where your heart pulls you and, and go there. As we wrap up, I just want to say thank you guys for speaking and speaking from the heart and trying to impact the recruiting community. It's You guys don't know how much of an impact you're making. And the best recruiter therapies um, is always right after this conference. We have the most attendees that join that because we talk about the impact even after a couple days. So today's Tuesday. We have another recruiter therapy on Thursday. And people come and talk about impact on how somebody reached out to them after the conference. Or they maybe heard something in somebody's presentations that got them right on track on a mindset standpoint. The things that you guys are doing is impacting the community now and for future um, recruiters to come. So thanks again. People always ask me like, why do you have the community hire easy on your, your name? I never have my personal name on here. And there's a reason for that because it's not about me of trying to put this presentation on and these conferences and the webinars. I put community higher easy because community is the most important thing. It's all about the people that come to educate themselves and build relationships that extend farther than a handshake or a social media like. So please get involved in the higher easy community, the Outbound Recruiting Academy, future webinars, FRBR conferences, because all those things are 100% free to impact you in your career and hopefully you're gonna be on stage at one of these conferences coming up and you can make that same impact. So again, as we wrap up, thank you so much, Hire Easy, and everybody that's involved today. Um, there's a lot of work that had to do to get everybody involved and, and, and put this on. So thank you so much for everybody in the, the backstages. So thanks again. 
Um, looking forward to seeing everybody on Thursday for another recruiter therapy. And um, again, thanks again. So I appreciate everybody.